Good afternoon. It is my great pleasure to introduce Beth Rabinowitz. Um, she is an associate professor um, at the University of New Jersey, Rutgers Camden, um, with a joint appointment in political science and public policy. Um, Beth asks big questions. Um, her research tends to be wildly ambitious. Um, she seeks to do no less than unravel the sources of political stability and instability in developing countries and in developed countries alike. Uh, her first book was called Coups, Rivals in the Modern State, Why Rural Coalitions Matter in Sub-Saharan Africa. And in this book, she examined why some neopatrimonial leaders promote development and increased state capacity while others do not. She began with a two country comparison of Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, but then she went on and extended the study to 18 more cases and uh, addressed the question of why some African countries are able to avoid the coup trap while many others are not. Ultimately, she turned the urban bias literature on its head suggesting that leaders who develop a rural alliance strategy achieve greater stability and confront fewer coups than those who favor an urban mobilization strategy. In the second book, she takes a completely new turn. And, not, and I'm not gonna tell you about that because that's what we're gonna hear about today. Testing, testing, oh, okay, I guess that works. Well, I'm going to stand up for one thing and say, to begin with, thank you so much for having me. In particular, thank you to you, Steve, and to you, Paul, for helping organize this talk. I'm very appreciative and excited to speak to you guys. Um, there is a handout, which people are giving just because it's too hard to get on a slide. Um, Steve likes to say that this is a big book, not as picketies. It's not 600 pages, but it uh, covers a lot of ground. So I'm going to try and do my best to cover some of that ground. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has about things that I've left off, or if you want to challenge any of my ideas, that's fine too. Um, and so um, I want to start by, well, obviously I'm speaking about my new book, Defense of Nationalism, Explaining the Rise of Populism and Fascism in the 21st Century. It came out in July of 2023 with Oxford. and um, I want to at least give you a sense of why I started on this project. Um, so I actually started in 2015. In fact, it's been my good fortune that it took me so long because now people are interested. <laughs> when I was talking about the possibility of fascism and world wars, you know, seven years ago, people thought I was cuckoo. Um, so including Steve. <laughs> he once wrote to me, he's like, Beth, are you suggesting we're moving towards fascism and world wars? And I'm like, I'm suggesting it's a possibility. So anyhow, um, anyhow, the reason I started in 2015 was pretty much twofold. One was this was at the time when uh, Trump was launching his first presidential campaign. This was the time of Brexit, right? This was a time when we saw people like Marie Le Pen in you know in surging, um, and so what you know different thing you know illiberal liberalism and Hungary whatever. Um, but I felt like there wasn't a lot of discussion of how these things interconnected. And having been someone who studied nationalism and ethnic conflict, I felt very strongly that there were some clear similarities going on and particularly the surge of nationalist kind of discourse. And I wanted to figure that out. The second reason I wanted to figure that out was because I was about to teach my course on nationalism and ethnic conflict. And as one does, we want to update it. And so I initially looked for any kind of literature I could find that would give me a clue as to how this, what I saw as new manifestation of nationalism or spread of nationalism related to one of the most formidable ones, which was in the 19th century and the post-Napoleonic War. And I just didn't find at that time very much out there. So I started creating this table, which is uh, what we've offered you if you want to look at it. Um, it's too much information for me to put it on the slide, but if anybody has any questions about any of that, I'm happy to, to go into it. At any rate, so those two things sort of brought me to this. And obviously, since 2015, these tendencies have only increased. Um, 
So, you know, today, you know, we're seeing a world which is wildly polarized around you, around the globe. We're seeing really dysfunctional politics, strange elections, most recently, obviously, in Argentina and Netherlands, but also recently in Sweden, Finland, you know, uh, Italy. <laughs> um, in addition, um, we're seeing sort of a rise of political violence in countries that have traditionally been democratic institutionalized countries like the United States and South Korea. Um, and we're also seeing sort of a rise in international conflict and violence. There was a recent report about how the, the casualty rate uh, from 2022 to 2023 doubled in terms of both internal and external conflicts. Um, and so could it possibly be that there's something that can explain how these things, why these things are happening and how they might be interrelated. And so, uh, you know, perhaps ambitiously, I have an answer, which is yes. And so this is actually where I started. I can't see my own slides. Um, this is where I started in 2015. My, my suspicion was that what we were seeing and the reason we were seeing the spread of nationalism in so many different countries was because we were seeing a broader sort of response to macro structural change and that was what I kind of hoped to un unravel. Um, and so I developed this concept of defensive nationalism as a, a way of explaining what the responses were. And I'll explain to you what I thought the macro structural change was as well. Um, <clears throat> so in my book, sort of the outline of the book is sort of, uh, it begins with the definitions and particularly definitions of nationalism and defensive nationalism, uh, distinguishing it from populism and nativism and fascism. Uh, then I uh, have a theory of how this emerged and why this is emerging now and why this seems to resemble things from a century ago. And then um, I use a four part uh, history comparative analysis between turn of the 19th and turn of the 20th century to give some empirical substance to my claims. <clears throat> so I'm just going to begin with his defensive nationalism, right? Um, there are a few people who have used the term, but it hasn't been particularly well codified. I think I'm the first person to really kind of flesh it out as I understand it. And so uh, the simplest terms, I'm arguing that it's where uh, populism and nationalism merge. So what do I mean by that? If we strip down populism to its very elemental form, it's basically an opposition that's vertical between the people and the elites in, the, in its essence. It can be applied to lots of different kinds of ideologies, lots of different kinds of political systems, but in its essence, it sort of boils down to that. Similarly, if we boil down nationalism, it's essentially right, a horizontal opposition between us and them in groups and out groups, right? Um, so um, people have argued that these are very different things. I'm arguing where they, they meet is what I'm calling defensive nationalism. And so I'm arguing that the, the vertical and the horizontal come together. And they do so because the global, the, the elites or the other are the globalizing enemy and the people, or us, are the nation. And so what we're seeing is a broader response to what is perceived as a globalizing enemy and a surge in nationalist discourse and nationalist movements as a result, which I'm calling defensive nationalism. So in addition, in order to understand what this is, I developed a tripart uh, typology of nationalism for the most part, I'm not trying to redefine nationalism, give different kinds of explanations for what it means or what it is. Rather, I was trying to reorganize this sort of vast, you know, octopoid kind of uh, literature, both in terms of theory and in terms of case studies, and suggest another way we could look at it and understand the relationship and the interrelationships within nationalism. And so these are the three categories I developed. Um, I'll speak more if you want at the end about this typology, but I'll just go briefly through this right now. Um, so first I identify creative nationalism, um, which is any kind of study or any kind of political movement uh, 
where people are trying to create a nation or say there is a nation that has not been recognized. It generally involves things like definitions of who is in the nation, political elites who mobilize people around those processes. And often it's, if not almost always, not always though, uh, it's uh, about politically mobilizing people to get a state for the nation, okay? Um, and that can include separatist movements, irredentist movements, independence movements. There could be lots of different ways in which that manifests. Oops. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry. So consolidating nationalism by contrast is not about creating a new state, but it, what it, it's what occurs in an existing state. If anybody's familiar with Billing's idea of but now nationalism, it comes closest to that definition. But it, the idea is just that as states develop and demographics change and economics change and ideologies change, you ha continually have to reintegrate the, 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 the national community and redefine it and re-understand it. And so it's through these processes of uh, consolidating nationalism that that kind of occurs. This can be a formal process where it's citizenship laws that are, are reorganized and changed. It could be also about national curricula that are changed or things like that. It can also be part of the, you know, and also the identification or creation of national holidays. Um, it can also be, you know, sort of much more informal in terms of the ways in which we sing the national anthem at particular events, raise the flag, uh, celebrate our unique culture, our unique foods, our unique whatever, right? So that's what I understand as consolidating nationalism. And then finally, defensive nationalism, which I think I'm, I'm more unique in, in looking at. And that is also within an existing state, but this occurs in response to globalization. And it's a movement which is focused on preserving national sovereignty and protecting the nation against these globalizing forces. And so um, in understanding these things, I argue that I kind of use the analogy of evolutionary biology and make the case that consolidating nationalism is very close to um, what's called static equilibrium when you know a, a species or starts to adapt, but slowly, and doesn't have any kind of dramatic change over time. And so this doesn't occur as an era or a wave. It's something that's just a continual process for every nation state. Creative and defensive nationalism, by contrast, are things that happen uh, in more like what is called punctuated equilibrium, um, where it's about an exogenous shock of some sort, particularly, that, that hits multiple areas at the same time. And so therefore you can get a wave of creative nationalism or a wave of defensive nationalism. I identify three waves of creative nationalism, as I spoke before, the post-Napoleonic period in the 19th century where you had empires falling, dominoing, and you had a lot of uh, people advocating for new states. Secondly, after World War II with the end of colonialism, and so you had another wave of uh, defensive, uh, creative nationalism in, um, in Africa, in um, the Middle East, in Asia. And then finally, the post-Soviet uh, period where you started to see yet another, right? So it's a wave in the Caucasus and East Europe, et cetera, right? And so this is in response to the fall of an empire pretty much, right? Um, whereas defensive nationalism is different. I argue that defensive nationalism, again, is a response to globalizing changes. And the reason, of course, that we can see this across so many countries and similarities in responses across so many countries is because they're hit at the same time by very similar forces and in very similar ways, which isn't to say that individual nations with individual histories and individual political leaders don't matter. It's not that deterministic, but there is a, you know, a, a similarity in these responses that we can identify as a wave in the way you could democracy, right? Which is slightly different in lots of different places. And so um, 
I, I identify two major periods of defensive nationalism as an era, and they are both the turn of the centuries. So more specifically, I argue that defensive nationalism is a response to modern globalization. And it's a response to modern globalization that emanates out of, particularly out of revolutionary changes to transportation and communications. And so I distinguish modern globalization from other forms because we know, you know, the Mongols and, you know, the Romans and, you know, the, the trading uh, systems of the 12th century and colonialism. These are all forms of globalization. But what distinguishes this are these kinds of attributes uh, that, um, for example, you know, David Harvey uh, discussed this extreme time-space compression, which occurs, which can really impact cultures, society in lots of different ways. Um, uh, Roderick speaks of this as hyper-globalization more recently. And I think also one of the critical aspects is what Jameson sort of points to, which is the free-flowing of capital uh, around the globe and how that impacts countries simultaneously. <clears throat> so, you know, I guess, you know, one of the ways to frame the question is, how could it be that history is, quote unquote, repeating itself? Obviously, history doesn't really repeat itself. How could it be that we could see, or I could argue, that we're in a really similar period to 100 years ago? And so in order to make that argument, I appeal to two political economists, political sociologists from the first half of the 20th century, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. And one is beloved in Berkeley, which is Polanyi and the Great Transformation. The other, maybe less so, but very beloved in Silicon Valley is Joseph Schumpeter, right? <laughs> Pick your poison. So, uh, so you know, as, as a Berkeleyite, you know, I've been indoctrinated into Polanyi for a while. And, you know, in teaching Polanyi, I always suggested that could there be another double movement? Um, and so this immediately came to mind when I was thinking about the changes that we're seeing today. So I, what I'm taking from Polanyi in this is his general insight, which I'm sort of transliterating into this idea of globalization, that um, that globalization is a, a dual process that's antithetical, right? That it's both formed through this principle of increasing economic liberalism based on free market ideologies, based on the idea of self-regulating markets um, and lack of government intervention. And at the very same time, it's a movement that requires, that develops into social protectionism, and different forms of advocacy for groups and for government intervention in markets, et cetera, et cetera. That these things happen in tandem, right? So I'm using this as sort of a springboard. And so in terms of, I'm just gonna do short shrift. I think if anybody has any further questions, I'm happy to answer. But you know, in terms of how this starts, right? Um, oh, I'm sorry, of course, it's the double movement. <laughs> um, that we're looking at here. And the question is, why would we be in a second double movement, right? Um, and so, you know, Polanyi argues that uh, the double movement was set off in the 19th century um, when finance capital, or what he calls haute finance, started to really rule the world. You had the Rothschilds, you know, who were really kind of, um, controlling or dictating or guiding politics, uh, both domestically and internationally. And he argued this was sort of a unique period in human history. This had never happened before. And the mechanism he argued for why that happened was the gold standard. Of course, gold has been a medium of exchange for millennia. But what was distinct about the gold standard was it was the first time internationally that you had one form of exchange that could be used anywhere. And that obviously facilitated enormous uh, spike in trade, uh, enormous spike in finance and global speculation. And so that's what he argues led if, if, uh, effectively to um, this new period, this global liberalized period of sort of what's been called by uh, Summers and Bloch market fundamentalism. And so with this, 
the reason it's a double movement is because it was the spread of this free market ideology, um, which um, argued obviously against government intervention, et cetera, it created all kinds of social dislocations. Um, there was retrenchment in all kinds of social protections. And um, in, in essence, it was just an unsustainable system. And so this is why he argues you have a double movement, that that's inherent to this system. In fact, as Block and Summers argue, I think compellingly, they think it's akin to the Marxist idea of the contradiction in the capitalist system. Here is a contradiction in liberal, liberal economic, political system that it, it doesn't function because it's it, it can't that it has its own internal contradiction that will le eventually lead to its counterpart. Um, and so in particular, he argued that, you know, this, this idea of the institutional separation between politics and economics, and this idea that economics should be allowed to move on its own, and that politics should be relegated to, you know, building bridges, um, was a deadly, <laughs> that it created all kinds of problems for all kinds of people, um, that, you know, you see, therefore, this rise in labor movements, environmental movements, women's movements, even trade movements where their, their businesses are clamoring for protectionism, because the system itself was contradicted, right? And so, in particular, he, he speaks to the fact that this was a utopian fiction, um, and he speaks to how this utopian fiction led us to these ideals that were so dysfunctional. Um, <clears throat> and so in particular, what he uh, identifies as the, the kernel of the problem was that this period of uh, this, this, this ideology was based on the idea of freedom and liberty, which then was defined in very narrow terms, in terms of the right for uh, engaging in contracts. And as he says, you know, liberty involves a broad spectrum of rights. That's insufficient to begin with. Those rights have to be enforceable under the law. The market can't do that on its own. And so in general, this liberal economic system focused on liberty and freedom at the cost of justice and security. That was the deep contradiction within it. And so he argues that with the liberalization, oh, I'm sorry. So I'm sorry, I'm not looking at my slides. So the question is, could we be in a second double movement? There are a number of scholars who have suggested that we are. We've seen since the 1970s, the expansion of globalization with the new fiat system uh, and capital becoming again free flowing. Uh, we see uh, hyper-globalization towards the end of the century, which comes with these new technologies. We see then this resurgence of protectionism and nationalism that seem to be very similar to the kinds of processes that uh, Polanyi was underscoring. Um, but there's, there's a lot of problems in applying the double movement to another period. For one thing, Polanyi, as I imagine you guys know, is incredibly poetic and evocative, but doesn't give us a handle often on how to understand what the mechanisms are that set things off. He doesn't really explain how this happens. He speaks about how the double movement, you know, society uh, spontaneously rises against, uh, you know, liberalism. But what does that mean? What is society? How does it rise again? What is exactly he's speaking of? Why exactly does finance capitalism take off? Or does it, you know, he, again, he's sort of, he's a little vague on all of these centers. Secondly, um, you know, there's always a problem with applying a historical analysis from a different period to the contemporary period. Polanyi is very clear that he's saying this was, the 19th century was sui generis, that it was really built out of ideologies developed by Malthus and Ricard Ricardo. He refers to it to, this, to the Ricardian uh, Britain. So does it really make sense? You know, is this what historians call presentism where you're applying what was in the past to the, to the present and what is in the present to the past. You know, you can make a lot of uh, dangerous mistakes in doing so. 
And moreover, you know, within the Polanyan literature, there's no clear consensus on how to interpret the double movement and what exactly it means and how it arises. So my project for myself was to find some kind of rigorous way to account for a second double movement, to find some way to concretize what he means by the rise of liberalism or how that comes about, what the mechanisms could be, and then also concretize better what he means by this societal uh, pushback against liberalism. And so I do it in two ways. First, uh, in the way in which I define uh, what this, the, the, let's see, where do I start here? The rise of the liberal order, and then what I describe as, you know, the second half, the, the social response. So in order to understand the rise of the liberal order, I appeal to Joseph Schumpeter. So as I said, Polanyi's idea was that the, you know, gold standard and finance capital is what brought about liberalism. Schumpeter believed Polanyi kind of got this all backwards. Schumpeter argued that finance chases something that's much more fundamental. And for him, that is innovation and changes in technology. Um, and so that to say that finance set this off for him was completely backwards. He makes this argument more broadly, but in particular about the 19th century, he argues that the key innovation was railroadization that came with attendant other kinds of innovations, changes in coal and oil, et cetera. <laughs> but that was the key. And what he argued is this was the first time in history you had these massive capital projects that required massive amounts of, of investment. And that stimulated new forms of financing, new forms of banking. And this is when he said you get this rise of state banks, national banks around the world. Um, and that that sets off you know, finance capital that leads to the need for a global standard, that, which is the gold standard. Um, and also he understands the end of any of these kinds of big, he argues that innovation comes in roughly 50 year cycles and that the end, the beginning starts with this speculation and this boom economy. The end is when the speculation runs ahead of or beyond what's actually needed and you get a bust and then you go into a downward cycle. And so what Polanyi sort of identifies as the second half of the double movement Schumpeter speaks to as uh, the neo-mercantile movement that comes after high liberalism. For him, this is a very sad event that capitalism sort of failed uh, and went into neo-mercantilism. Neo um, but the idea, again, that it's about securitizing um, things and, and putting in protections that are government spending, et cetera, et cetera, rather than letting the free market roam. So in looking at the two arguments, was it the gold standard? Was it railroadization? One of the things I found was arguably, if we're going to say that high finance was one of the things that really stimulated this process, that actually started way before many countries had adopted the gold standard. Arguably, it started with this, uh, this new form of, of banking and, and lending, which was called Credit Mobilier. Uh, these Pierre brothers, in France who were trying to compete really with the Rothschilds and whose fortune, by the way, was made by financing French railroads, devised a new form of banking, which was based on long-term lending instead of short-term lending. And this, as Gershenkron argued, diffused rapidly around the, around the world. Lots of uh, different countries had credit mobilier kinds of uh, systems that emerged. And this is really when you start to get this major uh, international finance capitalism, particularly for railroads. Moreover, you know, if you look, you know, at the rise, um, these are not exactly compatible in terms of the, you know, the, uh, what they're looking about. This is percentages and, you know, this is a little bit different miles, <laughs> but this was uh, when uh, miles were increasing in uh, American railroads. And this is when banks, national banks were emerging. And it's striking, right, how similar the curves are, okay? 
which to me is rather compelling in terms of this idea that the 1850s is really where you see this takeoff and that it's related to this process of railroadization. Moreover, and this, you know, I made myself, so there may be some inaccuracies, but it gives you a general sense. If we compare the rise of uh, the number of banks that are created over time uh, relative to the number of countries that are on the gold standard, again, we can see 1850s is really when banking starts to take off um, and national banks are created, while it's not till the 1870s that the gold standard really becomes internationalized in the way in which Polanyi argues. So I believe in terms of, just in terms of the evidence that Schumpeter has a more compelling argument for how this all began. Um, oops, okay. So I'm using this as a way of understanding the beginning of liberalism in terms of technology, not in terms of finance capitalism or changes in international uh, exchange. <clears throat> the second thing I'm trying to do is concretize the response against liberalism. And so in order to get a clue for how to think about it, you know, Polanyi in his concluding chapter basically says what was missing in liberalism was they forgot about society. And most importantly, they forgot about the role of the state in changing and ameliorating, speeding up, slowing down change such that it protects society. And that was what was not sustainable, right? Um, and so <clears throat> the question is, what is society in this, in this picture. And so I'm arguing that one way that we can concretize what he's meaning is through this concept of defensive nationalism. So if it is that we lost the state and we lost the understanding of how the state functions to protect society, what is the state? Since the 20th century, we live in a nation state system. Even if you're a totalitarian regime, a kingdom, you justify your being in terms of representing your nation. Um, so effectively, we're talking about nation states. And so I'm arguing by extension, we're talking about nationalism and how nationalism is important to protect the body politic, particularly against external uh, globalizing forces. <clears throat> and in fact, there is evidence within Polanyi that he saw nationalism as critical, right, in this quote. He says, the world continued to believe in internationalism and interdependence while acting on the impulses of nationalism and self-sufficiency. In truth, the new nationalism was the corollary of the new internationalism. They developed in tandem. <clears throat> so that's part of my justification for, for you using this idea of defensive nationalism to understand what we could call the second half of Polanyi's movement. And so this is the model I've developed, which is not coming up. Awesome. That's not good. <laughs> well, it should have, okay, globalizing technology, two arrows, goes to uh, liberalism and social dislocation, uh, which then goes to defensive nationalism, right? And so this part is uh, Schumpeter, globalizing technology, and then the next part, the, con the con concomitant uh, development. Oh. This slide or? No. Just to this, this one isn't that, sure. That's not, yeah, gotcha. that one. Yep. Okay. Anyhow. <clears throat> um, and then obviously the, the responses, which are both sort of high liberalism and dislocation, and then uh, this response of, of, of defensive national is from Polanyi. And so in general, what I argue is the outcomes, so again, I've, I've focused primarily on, or exclusively on changes in transportation and communications specifically um, in both of these errors, eras. And so I'm arguing that um, that's what creates this hyper inter, in, interconnectivity. That's what creates the flows of capital. That's what creates all of these processes. And in both centuries, we can see really similar kinds of changes that occurred after the emergence of these new technologies, whether it be global trade blooming, whether it mean the creation of new mass media, whether it mean you know, new forms of, of trade 
mail order develops, mail order catalog develops because of uh, railroads and things like that, just like email, uh, e-commerce, e uh, because of, you know, internet. Um, you also get in both these periods a spike in international agreements as well as NGOs. So that's sort of part of what's on that sheet that I handed out to you. And then I examined pr pretty much seven dislocations that also happened in both these periods in response to these changes from technology. Um, and so I focus on how economic production changed from, you know, the first period was agriculture to industry. Um, the second period was the Fordist model to flexible production, both of which left people in the periphery outside and sort of favored urban centers, um, that you saw financial speculation rise, which led to global failures, global economic contagious crises. You saw wealth concentration in both these periods. I think many of us are familiar with that pendulum uh, between you know, the robber barons of the late uh, 19th century and sort of the captains of Silicon Valley and banking today. Uh, but enormous wealth concentration that develops also because of political liberalism and the idea that market forces should be left to their own devices. Um, with mass media, in both eras, you saw this uh, creation of new forms of what we'd call fake news today. At that time, it was yellow journalism. Um, <clears throat> you had massive labor migrations in both of these periods. Hobsbawm describes uh, the late 19th century as this enormous uh, churning of peoples that had never existed before. And we were in the second kind of period of mass migration uh, starting in the 80s. Um, I unique, I think, in looking about this also in terms of global terrorism. So 1880s, 1890s was when you got anarchist terrorism. 18, I'm going to forget the years now, but the, the decade from the mid 80s or whatever, the early 80s to the 90s or late 90s, whatever, was known as the decade of regicide, where the anarchists assassinated more heads of state than ever in history, including President McKinley. Um, and um, it was also the first time you had people who were randomly lobbying, uh, you know, bombs into civil, you know, just normal areas like cafes and um, um, opera houses. It was the, Hay the Haymarket Square during a labor uh, protest here in the United States. And these were happening simultaneously around many places. In some ways, they seemed choreographed across countries in a new globalizing way. They were associated uh, with the immigrant populations of the time, which were the Irish, the Germans, the Jews, the you know, Eastern Europeans, the Italians, who were all migrating and who had all become very much uh, interested in both communism and anarchism because they were the downtrodden. Um, only a handful actually become really violent, but that gets spread to all anarchists, right? And so I found that to be very similar to what happened, this was the 1890s, what happened in the 1990s, where you see the rise of Al-Qaeda. There had been Islamist uh, Islamic terrorism, I should say, or whatever. But this was these were national movements, whether it was the PLO or it was, you know, the Brotherhoods. Um, they were, they were, their interest was in advocating for national causes. It's only when you get, um, when you get uh, bin Laden transforming the Afghani fight uh, against the Russians to Al-Qaeda that you start to see a new surge of globalized terrorism. And in both these periods, they were both not only facilitated by the new technologies which allowed them to globalize, but they were also in response to global capitalism. Both of them were trying to fight against global capitalism. And both of those terrorist movements were anti-state, anti-nation state. Anti uh, for different reasons, and their goals were slightly different, but very similar in processes. And obviously, Al-Qaeda was associated with immigrants, um, and that led to massive anti-immigrant campaigns, um, which was furthered by this sensationalized new press, just like had happened with the anarchists in the uh, early 
late 19th, early 20th century. So <laughs> some of the advantages of talking about defensive nationalism as a form of national populism is that it allows you to distinguish this from other forms of populism. Populism, like nationalism, is a little confusing. Uh, this is the only, <laughs> the only category I've created. Uh, Ruth has done a lot more in terms of thinking about different categories for thinking about populism. But here, I'm just talking about it in terms of what defensive nationalism is and how it differs from other places, because it has these two key elements. One is that it's about anti-globalization and the other is that it's about preserving national, national sovereignty. So for example, if we think about sort of the uh, leftist um, political movements at the end of the 19th century that were populist, they were communism and anarchism which were radically anti-nation state. So they were similar, but they were very different in terms of their goals. Um, I, I think that's akin to the late 19th, the 20th century and the 1990s in particular, when you start to see this anti-WTO movements, these global environmental movements, which were not considered nationalist movements, right? They coined the term global, right? This idea that the, the local is the global and embracing the way in which the new technologies could allow us to work across countries to work for the environment to work for labor, to work for indigenous rights, not about how we needed to fight for national sovereignty and national protection. Similarly, if you can look at it on the right, there have been other populist movements on the right. KKK obviously was a right-wing populist movement. It emerged from particular circumstances within the United States and was not focused on globalization. It was focused on uh, the end of slavery and uh, reasserting white rights in the South. Um, and then you could argue that in the 1980s, we saw another surge, perhaps, of right-wing um, kind of populism with Reagan and Thatcher and Berlusconi. But once again, even though they had similar kinds of rhetoric, they were not anti-globalization. And so I'm arguing that if we use this concept of defensive nationalism, we can begin to differentiate among forms of populism. The other kind of advantage I find is that I believe this can help us understand why we're seeing this rise in political polarization. And that's because it is a populist age. And as a populist age, its core is anti-establishment. If you're anti-establishment, then the middle represents the establishment. The middle represents those politicians that have been gaining from the global system, corrupted, taking money from the people. Who wants to vote for them? So that pushes people to the extremes. There isn't any middle ground. And so you start to see this emergence of polarization. Also, if I'm right about the hallmarks of defensive nationalism, then it has these key components. Decreased in trust in system, dysfunctional domestic politics because of globalization, uh, polarization, increased fear of uh, international institutions which can lead to isolationism, um, and this need to protect from foreign actors which can lead to forms of militarism, particularly on the right. That combination spells something scary to me. The likelihood that we will be seeing more conflict, not less. Um, I won't go through the empirical evidence. I'll just sort of nod to it. The way in which I sort of try again and situate this in actual historical differences was looking 1860 to 1920 and 1960 to 2020 or actually literally 1862, the World War I to 1914. And I ended it in 2020 because again, I started this earlier. <laughs> and so that seemed right. Now I'm not trying to be cute in this periodicity. I chose it for a very particular reason. And that's because 1860 is when you start to see the surge in railroads and in particularly in passenger railroads, but also in terms of cargo, which allowed for dra dramatic changes. You know, for example, in the United States, very, people, very few people used postal system because it was so expensive and so slow and so toilsome. And um, with railroads, 
that explodes, right? Instead of like five people getting mail, now it's hundreds. Um, similarly, 1960 is when you start to see both, you know, railroads and, and airplanes had been around for, for decades. But again, it's the 60s where you see this sort of spike, particularly in passenger forms. And so uh, 1960 is known as the jet age. One of the critical things was the new turbo engines, right? And this is where you start to see average people in large numbers taking planes. It wasn't just, you know, the Queen of England in her lovely hats and <laughs> on these very uncomfortable planes. At the same time, you're getting oceanic changes in transportation. So um, in the late 1860s, but moving into the 1870s, you start to get new forms of steamship. And what was critical was a new marine boiler, which was a convection boiler, which allowed you to use a different fuel. Formerly, they had used wood, and there's only so much wood you could carry. Uh, it's bulky. Using coal allowed them to use far more fuel, uh, to carry far more fuel, and therefore go much farther. So that exponentially changed ocean travel. You also critical was the Suez Canal, which for at least for trade and um, global trade, that was critical in terms of making it possible for these uh, ocean liners or ocean steamships, I should say, to travel around without having circumnavigate Africa, which of course would have cost them a lot more. I see a parallel change in the 1970s with containerization. Um, not a very sexy topic, it would seem, but it's really critical in terms of how it changed trade. Um, you know, you had this sort of massive dysfunctions in terms of cargo being everywhere. This allowed for this really mellifluous process of putting things in, taking things off. We still use containers, right? Um, it's only expanded since then. And it was in the 1970s that you first get containers used on a larger scale. <clears throat> Lastly, you had communications revolutions in both these periods. So in the 1860s, what was made possible was the telegraph. 1858 is when the first uh, transatlantic cable was laid, and then very soon after you started to see cables moving in around the world. So this was, of course, the, the, the internet of its day. Instead of it taking weeks to get uh, information across the Atlantic, it was instantaneous. Uh, people discussed it at the time in very similar terms to the way we discuss the internet. People were getting married over the telegraph even. Um, you know, all of these kinds of people were doing fraud over the telegraph. Um, so, but this instantaneous change of uh, possibility of information dramatically changed the way people interacted, the way which news was broadcast, all of these things. At the same time, you also get ticker tape, which was equally exponential in terms of trade and finance allowing people to have up to the minute information about how trade was changing. And finally, you get the printing press and new forms of paper. Before this, before the 1860s, paper was made from cotton rags. And it was a rather laborious process. It's in the 1860s that you get paper pulp, you know, probably where you get this term pulp fiction from, but you get the possibility to, to print uh, to, to create paper on a much larger scale and cheaply. At the same time, you get new forms of printing. So, um, you know, instead of having, you know, two people with the, you know, putting down a press and getting it up and getting a couple of thousand per day, now you had tens of thousands of, of copies uh, printed in an hour. Dramatic change, right? This is what allowed for mass communications at that time. Obviously, we know, you know, the uh, silicon chip really begins in the 1960s. It's what allowed for, um, for computer technologies to get smaller and smaller in particular, right? The first p computer was ENAC, which was thousands of tons and, you know, took up multiple rooms. Um, and now we have these tiny little things which are made possible by silicon chips um, and the internet, which first began uh, sort of in its infancy when you had this first exchange among colleges, uh, university, I should say, uh, you know, so it was the internetwork, which got shortened to internet, 
And then, you know, that took off exponentially. So that, of course, was our sort of revolution. So I don't know where we are with time. We're still okay? Soonish? Okay. Okay. So the other thing that I think that needs to be added is the political response, right? So I am defining in terms of defensive nationalism, but how exactly did society rise up? That still remains a bit of a question. And so I'm adding another thing, which is taken from the nationalist literature and the populist literature. The idea of political entrepreneurs, political leaders, populist leaders that so in, in populist literature, they differentiate between the demand side and supply side of populism. The demand side is the grievances that people are experiencing. The, the supply side is from politicians who are using that to gain elections. In the nationalist or ethnic conflict literature, uh, there's a lot of work on how uh, different individuals can use, uh, can manipulate populations uh, to fear other groups, for political gain. Um, and so combining those, I'm arguing that's really what's happening to, to uh, bring this to defensive nationalist movements around the world. And I also, and we don't have to go into this, I can speak to this if you want, I identify, which is also taken from both the uh, populist and nationalist literature, different dimensions for the left and the right. Uh, fundamentally, the easiest way to say it is if you have a globalizing enemy against the nation, the right and the left define those things differently, right? The left understands the, the nation more in what we've traditionally in nationalist literature call civic terms. So it's more about uh, legal and territorial uh, identity, whereas the right is in terms of identity terms, in terms of race, race and ethnicity and the Volk, the true people. And similarly, the globalizing enemy is understood by the left in class terms. It's the multinationals. It's the individuals like the, you know, Rockefellers and Rothschilds, or today, uh, you know, whatever uh, the Koch brothers who are rigging the game, who are buying politicians, who are transmuting politics, and that's the global enemy. Whereas on the right, the global enemy is ethnicized, is embodied. It's not a class of people. It's not a class system. It's not an economic system. It's the Jews. It's the Chinese and their, you know, currency manipulation and spreading the, you know, the, you know, viruses. And so, and it's also the immigrants who are, you know, desoiling our true national identity, our true people, and literally threatening genocide for the national peoples. For many people. Um, and so there are other ways in which I argue that, you know, so which is why the, the rhetoric for the left is about rights based, about fighting for enfranchisement, including more and more people, uh, ending wealth concentration. Whereas on the right, <laughs> it's about fear and survival. And on the left, it's about checking corporate wealth, et cetera. Whereas on the right, um, it's about uh, it's about moving progressively. I'm sorry, on the left, uh, towards increasing enfranchisement and rights. Whereas on the right, it's sort of backward-looking, retrogressive, restoring the traditional age that has been lost and the greatness of the nation. Um, so again, the value of this concept of defensive nationalism, I think, is threefold or multifold. One is it allows us to, to differentiate this from other forms of populism. The other is it helps explain the simultaneity of these processes across so many countries at once. And I also think it helps us understand the, the, the confluence of a lot of different kinds of things. I didn't go into the question about anti-rationalism and anti-science and uh, misogyny and anti-trans uh, anti and stuff, but I think, but I've found ways to understand that in terms of these concepts as well. If you want me to speak to that, I can. Um, and so where does this leave us? Well, <clears throat> I have been right on a lot of things early on, but I also am a little bit of a chicken little in that, for example, I wrote an editorial about why we should fear QAnon and why we should fear Giuliani's rhetoric about the stolen election in November before the, um, you know, before the next election, before January 6th. 
at that time, you know, people were talking about Giuliani's discourse in terms of, you know, that remember that thing where his hair dye was dripping down and the guy's crazy. And I was like, no, 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 we need to take this seriously. This stuff is real and the fear of the deep state is real and QAnon is real in terms of the threat. Most people thought I was crazy, right? So I was right about that. I also wrote an editorial um, after Biden came into power when there was still, uh, particularly on the left, this sense that, oh, he's going to bring us together. We're going to have to, we're going to get past this horrible division that was created under Trump. And I said, not so fast. If we maintain with this bifurcated media world, um, not likely that even if Biden is successful in, you know, changing the economy, doing everything he wants, it's not likely that this will heal those wounds. And sadly, I was writing about that. The one thing I will say is that I started getting scared about the election the summer before. I was actually terrified, but I was terrified of much greater violence than happened, which is why I say I'm a bit of a chicken little. Like, I really thought we were moving towards something incredibly violent. January 6th was violent, but I was expecting much worse. So this is sort of where I leave it. Um, I don't have very good things to suggest. I think these trends are going to continue. I think defensive nationalism is here to stay. And I think we should brace ourselves for more polarization, more dysfunction, more conflict. I'll leave it there. Okay, on, on that happy note, I'll open it up for uh, questions and comments. Um, please wait for me to give you the mic. Who wants to start? Thank you very much. I want to go back to your typology a little bit and ask you a question about the relationship between consolidating nationalism and defensive nationalism. So in your book, you talk about consolidating nationalism yeah. as an ongoing process that's integral to sort right. of a state reimagining and reintegrating itself right. continuously. And it's not an error compared to, or in contrast with the defense of nationalism. Yeah. So I'm curious, um, how do these two forces interact? What is the relationship between the two? Do, does one necessarily mitigate each one another? For example, can na defense of nationalism arise as nation states are continuing in their process of consolidating? Yes, or, I would. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Or are they sort of in conflict? Or how else would these two forces be at play with each other? Well, my purpose in, in differentiating those things is, I don't know how many of you are familiar, for example, with the, the book, uh, Peasants into Frenchmen. Okay, just a few of you. Uh, there was also a book by Wald Streicher, I get his name wrong, who, uh, who examined how the, in America, after uh, the revolution, Americans became Americans, right? How they stopped uh, celebrating Guy Fawkes Day, how they started to embrace ideas about Thanksgiving nationally. So these are the sort of more, again, mon mundane kind of processes uh, that happen over time, sort of incrementally, as I said. Um, whereas defensive nationalism is, again, this sort of very kind of virulent response to fear of globalization and fear of loss of national sovereignty. So I do see them as distinct. That, can they happen at the same time? Yes. But I would say, you know, analytically, we can see them as separate. Thank you very much. I think that the concept is, is working, is very useful, let's say, in the discussion. But still, I think that there are some contradictions that this concept, I think, does not resolve. OK. Uh, but before that, I would like to say that uh, you mentioned Stavrakakis the Greek scholar writing on populism. But Stavrakakis actually is belonging, let's say, to the left populism theory. Mm -hmm. And he, everything he, he wrote is about Syriza. Mm -hmm. And that has nothing to do with extreme right. So mm -hmm. because in the discussion about populism, actually, we have three, let's say, big currents. The left populism, the mainstream populism, and the uh, populism based on communication. So. Maybe Mude, for example, would be more useful in your case. Yeah, Mude, I do. Yeah, exactly. Because Savrakakis, let's say, he has a positive idea about populism. He tries to explain how a popular movement could become, let's say. Yes. Okay, but now, what are the contradictions that I don't see any answer through this concept? Yes. The first one is that, for example, if we take Le Pen or even Meloni, we know that both of them belong to the capitalist class. Or Meloni, let's say, uh, has a big funding from the national, let's say, Italian capital. Mm -hmm. the, the, the 
Italian industrialists. Okay? Yeah. Le Pen, it's a big family mm. okay, since the post-war. A lot of money and a, a, a family of entrepreneurs. So actually, they, they belong to the global capitalist class in a, in a certain way. Mm. Many of the parties in the extreme right wing Okay, um, uh, part they actually they have connections with the, with the, uh, global capital in a certain way. So this is a problem because if we apply your concept, we c we don't have a clear answer on this issue. And with that, for example, I could ask you. So in this case, what we should say about the tech CEOs mm -hmm. who are very reactionary and they belong to the global capital too? Okay. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that, for example, if we take the uh, Trump economic policy. He he promised a lot of protectionism, but mm. didn't didn't do actually. Sure. So you see, there is a, the rhetoric, and then also the the policies, okay. and then there are a lot of things that are more complicated many times. That's what. Okay. Gosh, I should have been writing that down. Let me uh, at least start with the the latter question. So um, you know, so I see uh, right wing defensive nationalism as proto or pre fascism. And fascism also fell very uncomfortably between the right and the left. And fascism was very pro-business, right? I mean, IBM worked very well for, for the Nazis. Uh, so that's different from the left, right, which sees the capitalist class as a problem. So I don't see a problem that they are from the capitalist class, right? The question is, I think the difference between right-wing defensive nationalism and fascism is the degree to which they advocate for authoritarianism. But, um, you know, even in the literature, it's not right to say that uh, fascism is on the right or on the left, because it's about um, uh, the mobilization of people against establishment, whereas conservative right wing movements are not. Right. Right. But then also, obviously, it's not liberal. <laughs> right. So I don't see a problem with that. In terms of rhetoric also, I don't see a problem. That's what ethnic entrepreneurs do. People use rhetoric to mobilize masses, right? Whether or not they actually come through with those policies is less material than whether or not they're actually mobilizing people along those lines, I would argue. I forgot the first thing that you mentioned. No, that was the last one. But again, that's sort of uh, whether or not you can have um, economic players that can gain the system and still advocate for these kinds of changes um, doesn't necessarily invalidate it. Um, I'm not as familiar though with the tech CEOs, but there was the first thing you said. Yeah, and so, so there's a wealth of literature that's come out, uh, you know, which has sort of demystified this idea and said that it's neither right nor left Mude is one of those, right, um, that really what we need to see it as is these sort of much more kind of um, streamlined, minimalist definition of populism that's more, more helpful and that it is on both the right and the left. For a while, there was like this deep argument, right? Leftists said, no, fascism can't be populism. And then others said, no, <laughs> you know. So, uh, but I, I think where the literature is now is rather, and again, in this minimalist definition. So that's not an issue anymore, as far as I can tell. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm wondering in your research, if you found or came across any meaningful difference between defensive nationalism in the global South and in the former colonies, than in the global north, um, at least the countries that I study, particularly in Latin America, it's what I've found, and also from living there, is it's not so much anti-globalization as, as actually anti the hegemonic powers in the global north and their control of especially economic matters and global politics. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that. I don't, because I did not study that, right? So I really relegated what I did to the U.S. and Europe, which was quite large to begin with. Uh, but obviously, we need to look at it globally and in terms of the global south. I mean, uh, you know, we see this in India and Bolivia and Peru and, you know, you, Argentina, you name it, right? So I, I think this could be extended and perhaps change. I'd be interested in how that might differ or not, but I haven't investigated it. Well, first I have to say thank you because I was, um, I'm a historian, so I was somewhat skeptical of your typology. Yes. Um, and you actually did a pretty good job of convincing me, but I will say my question is, is kind of where are the people in this, in the sense of populism is not necessarily popular 
And there are plenty of examples in the sense of Marine Le Pen hasn't actually won an election. Mm-hmm. The Nazis didn't get anything like a majority of the vote, neither did Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. You know, and so I'm when I, I'm just I think partly as a historian, but also kind of just as a thing, I'm I'm allergic to people saying to the argument that, oh, leaders rise up and manipulate the people. And so I'm wondering about well, so- where you see the where you see the the, I don't know, fulcrum of there uh, there is a massive kind of people who think of themselves as non-elites. And though, I, again, I think empirically that's not necessarily true. Certainly of Trump voters, they're not actually working, like the majority of them are not working class. Like they're just not. And so I'm just wondering where the people are and where, is is this really an argument about state capture and about how it shades into violence in the sense of fascism in Germany happened because there are a whole lot of little coincidences and a lot of political violence. January 6th happened, but Donald Trump is not still president because there are a whole lot of little coincidences. Like I, you know, I'm curious about the predictive power. And I think that's where I want to know whether just the actual ordinary mass of people are. Yeah. I mean, I'm again, I don't think it so much matters if they have a majority. I'm just saying that there's this tendency now of defensive nationalism. And keep in mind also that I started this earlier. And, and so one of the questions I've been asking myself is, um, if I'm right about this, at the time, you know, it was Bernie against Trump. Uh, we saw a surge of Eurosceptic parties that were on the right and the left. Um, you know, we saw during the COVID period in the United States, anarchists facing off against white nationalists. And what's happened in the last couple of years is the left has kind of dropped off. And um, I've been trying to think about what that is. I think perhaps it's because, it's sort of a rudimentary idea, um, that um, the threat to republicanism, right, the threat to the institutions that we have used as safeguards on the right is so extraordinary that the left is moving towards the center just to stop it, right? But um, there was certainly a sentiment um, that, you know, I think we are in a populist age. You know, anybody speak to undergraduates, right? The politics is evil, politicians are evil, establishment is evil, they're the problem. That's spread around the world. Um, so whether or not that wins you elections on one side or the other, I think that is a real movement in the world. Um, and so, and as you point to, I mean, the real danger now for the United States is precisely what the Nazis did, right? Where they didn't have a majority, but they were able nonetheless to gain power and then completely transform the system. But I mean, are you making an argument that that's the case in like every country that you studied? No. So as I said, there will be differences. Okay. I'm saying there's a general trend towards defensive nationalism around the world, but different countries with different histories, different economics, different ideologies, different political leaders will have more or less of it. So, but I'm saying that there's a trend across all of these countries in the same way that, you know, um, the argument that there was a wave of democracy in the you know, in the 70s or a wave of democracy, you know, uh, that kind of an idea that we can see this sort of happening across many places at once. She's not happy with me, but that's okay. Okay. I just wanted to know, you're making a distinction between right-wing populism and defense nationalism, and, and defense nationalism, right? No. So for you, it's a... Right-wing pos- po- populism is generally defensive nationalism. In this age? In this age. So then the question is, um, maybe you address this in, in, in right now in this section, but why is the left then not assuming uh, defensive nationalism? They are. They were. The left? Yeah. So, I mean, if you look at Eurosceptic parties, right, what were they about? They were anti-global and they were for protection of the national community and the national economy. So the thing that is that is the same across both sides is this economic nationalism emerges, uh, fear of globalization emerges, and uh, you know the idea of the need for national sovereignty. So in the, in the case of, I was mentioning some, I was writing down some cases here, like in the case of Podemos, which is not a thing anymore, like Podemos is not yeah. really, really bad. I'm low right now. 
Boric, Syriza, which was mentioned, and even Pedro right now, which is in power. Like, I don't really see that uh, that defensive nationalist element because uh, they, for the most part, they're facing uh, opponents in 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 the in the domestic context, which are really uh, enforcing this this idea of 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 protection of the nation. Mm -hmm. But so you cannot be necessarily fighting uh, people having this idea and at the same time having uh, the, the idea of defense and nationalism. I, I believe the concept is helpful mm -hmm. to explain uh, right-wing uh, populism, but I, I don't really see the left really taking this. Therefore, this concept to be able to describe populism in general. In general. So, as I said, I think in the last few years, it's become less relevant on the left, and I'm trying to understand why. But Bernie Sanders would, for me, be an example of left wing uh, defensive, as would Jeremy Corbyn, right? Where, you know, this extraordinary moment where avowed socialists <laughs> were, you know, all were competitive for the highest, uh, you know, state office uh, in the UK and the US. I mean, that was unheard of, right? Um, and as I said, Eurosceptic parties that were sort of spread across Europe were both on the right and the left. So, yes, I agree with you. I think now, for some reason, the left has sort of lost its steam in terms of these populist manifestations. Um, you know, in the United States, there were, you know, these kids who were voting for Trump just because they wanted the whole system to come down. And they thought that was going to do it. This was the first election. I hope they are not thinking that now. But, um, you know, and that was a, an extreme left wing uh, populist position. Thank you very much for your time today. Um, I guess I wanted to ask about the role of local elites or potentially like the upper middle class or lower upper class things that come to mind are like the independence movement in catalonia and like the general development and resurgence of catalan identity over the past hundred years that didn't really exist or had like a large gap largely driven by not the elite elite in those country in those nations um and i guess in a similar context thinking about like a technological change in the united states from like trains you have stops along the railroad that allows for capital accumulation in those different spots mm -hmm. but now is surpassed by superior communication technology. So I'd be curious, just like from almost like class or power dynamic, what you think is maybe driving this and how those uh, entities are using their capital, financial, social, cultural, and otherwise to like motivate some of this. You so I, I haven't done it granularly at that level, right? Um, and so I'm, I'm not familiar with Catalonian kind, of, the history of Catalonian nationalism. I'd be surprised if there were no elites involved in that and spreading that uh, kind of ideology on some level or another, helping codify what the, the idea of the Catalonian state is and how it's been dismembered or whatever. I imagine there must be, if it's people in the press, whatever, there are people who are helping propagate that to the masses or to the groups, the larger group. Um, and so, you know, I get the, the okay, I'll say this. Um, work out. One slide that I, you know, I took out, I think a major critique of my work is that it's uh, deterministic, right? And it, it really um, focuses a lot on how technology drives this and doesn't, doesn't include people in quite the same way, right? My excuse or reason for doing so is because my interest was understanding the simultaneity across so many countries at once um, and the patterns why the patterns look so similar. And for that, I felt you needed some sort of macro structural kinds of argument. Is it deterministic? Yes, it is. Um, this was something that uh, early on Steve presented to me. He's like, you know, wait a minute, what about politics? And so my fourth history, didn't want to get into this complexity though, is, uh, is about another addition that I make, which is ultimately I argue that these things emerge out of unique periods of, of peace, post-Napoleonic world and, and the concert of Europe and the post-Bretton Woods, in the post-World War II uh, Bretton Woods periods, where you had similar kinds of emergence of changes that um, allowed for trade to ratchet up, industry to be innovative, um, which also took not entirely, particularly in Europe, in the earlier period, but took a lot of conflict out of uh, the advanced economies overseas, right? Whether that was the colonial escapades, or that's a 
very nice way of putting it, but colonial wars, right? Or the proxy wars during the Cold War. And so it gave the space for the expansion of trade and, and, and industry and, and finance that otherwise might not have existed. It then led to the need for this international standard, whether it was global gold or the fiat system, because uh, I discuss how trade sort of busted open those former systems. Um, and you also, in, through these processes, you know, in both wars, this new hegemon came out, right? So it was, you know, Britain in the 19th century was the financial and industrial nation of the world that could then spread these ideologies, as um, Polanyi argues, um, or, you know, then it becomes America in the post-World War uh, two period, right, also strengthened industrially and financially by the wars in Britain weakened. Um, and so, um, you know, and then, then there's sociopolitical, I can, anyhow, so, uh, so, but these are very kind of, these are more political, but also very broad, right? I'm not drilling down to individual countries and individual leaders so much. Well, you know, if you follow, you know, the idea of um, political entrepreneurs, which was it Claire did not like the idea that people can be manipulated by elites. Uh, there is a lot of literature that suggests that is so. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you. I think we can put too much weight on it. Perhaps, you know, but there's a lot of literature for, you know, how Milosevic, you know, uh, ginned up the Serbian identity for his own political gains, or, you know, how Rwanda, the, uh, the radio, Rwanda, you know, the Hutu radio station ginned up fear of, uh, you know, the Tutsis and helped produce the genocide. So there's a lot of literature in ethnic conflict that discusses this instrumental level of nationalism and uh, ethnicity. Um, and, and so I subscribe to that. <laughs> I don't think it's the only thing, you know, you know, again, there's demand side and supply side for sure. Um, and it doesn't mean that it's gonna incorporate everybody, right? Uh, but it can be strong enough that it can really lead to serious consequences. That end, I, I have a question on sort of how conflict and political violence are, are outcomes here. Hmm. Uh, in that I, I'm wondering if you could be a little more specific about what the particular mechanism is mm -hmm. uh, between sort of defense and nationalism and these outcomes. And so are there types of political violence or conflict onset or sort of other sort of, if we if we disaggregate it and pull it apart, um, does your theory explain others? Um, I guess what would be sort of the most positive cases here? Uh, and then to what extent uh, is your theory actually getting at, at timing? I, I was just wondering, what is what is the linkage? What is the mechanism? Sure. So uh, again, so, um, you know, as an anti-establishment, a distrust of establishment, right, which has sort of become rife in so many places, that leads to the, you know, Machiavelli argued, right, that you need institutions to channel the humors of the different groups in order to make it peaceful, that they can, you know, fight on the streets, but you want don't want to have it behind the scenes, right? Um, and so I think that helps account in part for why you can see political violence escalating because the sense that the, the institutional channels are not going to do it for you. In terms of international uh, conflict, which I would expect to increase, uh, you know, if you have fear of international forums, fear of international capital that tends towards an isolationist kind of attitude. Um, get us away from them, let's protect ourselves. I think it's more on the right that you see this rise of militarism, which you saw both at the end of the 19th century and, the, and the, the, the sort of the beginning of the 21st century on the right in particular, where the, the, um, the, the military becomes both sort of the expression of the, the greatness of the nation, as well as the bulwark against these scary forces that are out there. Um, and, um, and then you have dysfunctional politics. So for example, we know that one of the reasons that things happened with Israel and Gaza was because there was so much dysfunction in the domestic politics that it allowed for things to go really far south. 
there are other reasons, obviously. I mean, I, I mean, I think that's an ex I mean, you know, I think the the Netanyahu is an example of right wing defense defensive nationalism right now, but um, mm -hmm. I'm the best. Anyhow, so I, I think this combination of a tendency towards isolationism, an increased tendency towards militarism, and an increased tendency towards dysfunctional polarized politics spells uh, danger. Last question. Okay. <laughs> I'm not convincing anybody, apparently. Great, so thanks so much for this. Um, so I just, one potential sort of discontinuity that came to mind between kind of the present era and yeah. Um, sort of the world, the first double movement that Polanyi charts. Yeah. Um, is there, a, you have a, a more of kind of full wholesale collapse of the kind of organizing international institutions. So the international gold standard, mm -hmm. um, the security aegis of the sort of Pax Britannia. Um, whereas today, it seems, it's, I think what an element that these different defensive nationalist movements share is an antipathy towards these governing international structures that really aren't in any threat of collapse in the same way that Polanyi is describing. Um, that as much as we may not like if we are um, a Marine Le Pen or a Donald Trump or whomever, mm -hmm. um, that we may not like um, globalization, international trade, international institutions, mm -hmm. multinational corporations, uh, the world that they have created is not going anywhere, at least in the near term. Um, so although they have clearly Perhaps. lost some degree of political legitimacy, the, the threat of kind of wholesale dislocation in that same way and I'm thinking in particular sort of the story that Adam Tooze tells in the deluge about sort of the inability of the League of Nations to form kind of a coherent governing structure in the interwar period. It strikes me that we're in a very different world from that degree of turmoil. Well, the interwar period would be different as well, right? It's leading up to fascism, not that period, A. B, I think there are incredible parallels between the problems that emerge in the gold standard because of exponential trade, the inability for gold to keep up with that as a commodity, right? Um, and so you did have global crises in the 1870s and then again in the 1890s, which led to ca catastrophic global uh, depressions, similar, I think, to 2008, for example, right? Um, if you look at my thing, you can see that I have it there. Um, and so in the 70s, in the similar way to the which the gold standard sort of fell by the wayside, you started to have, with the ratcheting up of trade and industry, uh, competition against the U.S. for the U.S. gold standard, right, it, that began, that really reached a height in the 60s with uh, Germany and Japan, and led to a place where it was clear that the, the gold standard on the U.S. dollar, the dollar was being propped up uh, artificially, and people were starting to get scared of the dollar. And at that point, Nixon, instead of trying to adjust it, which would have created all kinds of inflation here, and he was up for election, he went to the fiat system. So I think those are kind of similar processes. Um, the fiat system may not now be um, totally out of its way, but I do think you know we're about to see a change with cyber you know, currencies. Uh, that we haven't gotten to yet. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for good questions, and I'm sorry I did not convince any of you of your, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs>